a lot of the work in the meditation lies in just trying to stay in the present moment. So the mind finds it so easy to slip off to the past and the future that it's quite an accomplishment that you can stay right here with the breath, coming in, going out, continually. So whatever can get you here, either by taking an interest in the mind or in the present or by taking an interest in the breath and the present, you want to develop those skills. Sometimes people can settle down in the present moment and they're in a great hurry to move on. Say, what's the next step? Well, the next step is going to be right here. So you want to learn how to settle in, be here steadily and firmly. And in some cases, so much effort goes into settling in here that people then get discouraged to learn that there's more. Being in the present is not an end in and of itself. There's more work to be done. We're here because this is where the work can be done, where it has to be done. As the Buddha said, one of the keys to his gaining awakening was that he did not rest content with the skillful qualities that he developed. And it's this quality that really makes or breaks a meditator. Because some people get to the present moment and they're just happy to be there. And they say, well, the Buddha teaches contentment, so I'll just be content with whatever comes up. I'll just watch things arise and pass away and not get involved. And that's going to be okay. But that wasn't the Buddha's attitude. He said, what's, what's arising and passing away? Is there any potential in there for, for stress and suffering? They say that the difference between a genius and someone who's simply intelligent is that an intelligent person can solve a problem that people have seen for a long time. But a genius is someone who sees a problem that nobody else saw, saw and can solve the problem. That's the kind of person the Buddha was. He studied with teachers who were able to get their minds to very subtle levels of concentration. Nothingness, or neither perception nor non-perception. Yet he saw that there was still danger there, there was still a problem there. Didn't meet with his standards of totally deathless happiness. And so he moved on. And through trial and error, he finally found something that was a lot better. We remember his teachers simply because they were associated with him. If they hadn't been associated with the Buddha, their names would have been forgotten a long time ago. But the Buddha was special. He saw dangers where everybody else saw safety. And he was able to get beyond those dangers and show other people how they could get beyond those too. So this is something we have to emulate in our own practices, see where there are dangers that we hadn't noticed before, and find some way around them. This is one of the reasons why there's so much emphasis in, in the forest tradition when it teaches meditation on the quality of ingenuity. This is not the kind of meditation technique where you're told just to do one thing over and over and over again and don't think about it and don't ask questions about aside from questions about how to keep doing it more and more consistently. You're actually encouraged to explore in the John Lee's instructions about the breath. He gives you a few beginning recommendations. But then you see how he himself played with his recommendations. You realize there's a lot more going on in here than just what's in the short guide, or well, the John Mahabha's questions about pain. You're dealing with pain in the body, pain in the mind. You start asking questions about it, and start asking questions you didn't ask before. After all, we're here to see something we never saw before, which is going to require doing things we've never done before and asking questions we never asked before. 
And the more you're able to be ingenious in coming up with new questions, the more you'll also be able to be ingenious in seeing there are dangers where you didn't expect them. Very early on in his quest, the Buddha was approached by King, King Bimbisara, and this was well before the Buddha had become the Buddha. King Bimbisara saw with this mendicant who didn't look, an, look like an ordinary mendicant. He looked like a noble warrior. And it turned out he was. And so the king offered him a position in his army. And the Buddha responded, that that's not what I'm have gone forth for. I'm not going forth for sensual pleasures, because I see there are dangers in sensual pleasures, dangers in sensuality. Now, your sensuality means not just your indulgence in sensual pleasures, but it also means the mind's fascination. Just think, thinking about sensual thoughts, making sensual plans. And the Buddha saw it's right there, there, there's a danger. Most people don't see that. There was a writer a while back who said, desire is okay as long as you're not attached to the object. But as the Buddha noticed, we're really not attached as much to the object as we are to the act of desiring itself. You can sit and fantasize for hours about a sensual pleasure of one kind or another, even though the pleasure itself, when you actually encounter it, doesn't take that much time or doesn't provide you with that much time. But the mind can wear itself out with that kind of thinking and develop a weakness. It has this need to keep going for those sensual hits again and again. And the more you're dependent on a particular kind of happiness, a particular kind of way things are arranged outside, the weaker you are. And there's a danger there. But then the Buddha saw that there are further dangers as you go up the path. Like contentment itself. When I mean, you're content with whatever food you get, whatever clothing you get, whatever shelter you get. He says there's dangers even in that contentment, because there can be an element of pride. That you're content where other people are not. It's like that old onion, cart, onion article about the, the monk who is proclaimed in the Spiritual Olympics of being the most serene, and he shows you know, raising his hand in victory. Well, the pride that comes with that, that totally undoes whatever goodness there was in the serenity to begin with. So even in something as good as contentment, the Buddha said, there are dangers. Watch out. He saw dangers where people didn't see them. And it goes further. One of the ways he has of expressing the path is in the five strengths, in the five faculties. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These are all things we have to develop, and they require a lot of work in many cases. Having conviction in the Buddha's awakening is pretty demanding, because it sets forth the possibility that human beings can find a deathless happiness. And there are a lot of people, even people nowadays, who are teaching the Dharma, who shy away from that. Conviction in his awakening also means that there are things that human beings can know about karma, about rebirth, about the path to a deathless happiness and what it involves. And I've encountered Dharma teachers who'd rather say, well, the Buddha just had opinions about these things. and. Maybe he wasn't all that sure about them himself. That's simply trying to drag the Buddha down to their level so that they're not challenged by his life. So conviction takes something out of you. It makes demands on you. And same with persistence. The effort of the practice requires that you put in a lot of time and a lot of energy. Learn how to outwit the mind when it's trying to be lazy. 
motivate yourself so that you really are willing and happy to put forth the effort. The same with mindfulness, concentration, discernment. These things require work. But in order to develop them, there's going to be an element of conceit. So you have to watch out for that. The conceit simply that this is something I can do. It's necessary. That confidence in yourself is necessary. But it's going to have its drawbacks here and there. You identify yourself, you define yourself in certain ways for the purpose of the path, which is a lot better than defining yourself in ways that go against the path. But eventually even that provisional sense of self is going to have to, or those provisional selves, are going to have to be let go. There's an interesting passage where the Buddha talks about the different ways in which he was able to measure his awakening, to see that it was genuine awakening. And a lot of them seem pretty obvious, say, with feelings or cravings. He was able to see how they arose, how they passed away, what their allure was, what their drawbacks were, and then how he would escape from them. That makes a lot of sense, because these things are obvious, obviously ways of trapping the mind. What's more subtle is he talk, the Buddha talks at one point how he saw, even with his five strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, he saw how they arose and passed away, what their allure was, what their drawbacks were, and they escaped from them. In other words, he saw a problem where nobody else saw problems, and he was able to find a solution. That's why he was the Buddha. So we have to think about that as we practice. You can be perfectly fine in the present moment, or think you're fine, but you have to ask yourself, is there still a drawback to this? Whatever sense of peace or security I'm feeling right now, look for it. Because it's there. As long as it's not the deathless, there's going to be a drawback even to the factors of the path, to say nothing of the things that are off the path. So you can't be complacent. That's what a lot of contentment in the practice turns into if you're not careful. Complacent about your ability to be in the present, complacent about what little insights you get. You have to be constantly on the lookout for the dangers that these things contain. When you get an insight, look at what the mind is doing immediately after the insight to see how it responds or how it reacts, or what new sense of self develops around it. When you're convinced of the truth of an insight, as John Lee says, just as everything has a shadow, every truth has a false side to it. After all, truths are simply representations of something else. There's only one truth that's not a representation, and that's the truth of the deathless. And wherever there's a representation, it's like a mirage. It's not quite the real thing. So even when you think you've seen something really true, look for its false side. What this means is you have to be very demanding. You have to have those high standards. Set the same high standards for yourself that the Buddha set for himself. That you're not going to rest content with whatever level of skill you've got. Look for its drawbacks, and then try to figure out a way around them. This means that you've got to learn how to see problems in things you never saw as problematic before. It's a type of genius, but here's your opportunity. You can be a genius in concerning your own mind. Of course, a lot of being a genius also means you've seen your own stupidity, which is why people get awakened and have no pride around that.
So no matter how good your practice gets, remember it can still have its dangers. There are still problems there. And if you just get complacent and say, well, I'm going to be happy right here, content right here, you've shut the door on yourself. Close the door on any further progress. Is that what you want to do? Or would you rather keep the door open to see how far you can actually go?